All right. Looks like it's at the top of the hour according to my time clock. So that's where we're going to get started. Um, so look, Kelsey Hightower, some of you may know me from the Kubernetes community or communities before that. And since retiring from Google and a little bit before then, I've been advising startups. And one of those happens to be Acuity. This is the company behind Argo CD. And you may know them for their days at Intuit. They brought this better way of thinking about a deployment beyond the simple contrast that Kubernetes has brought. And one thing that they did really interesting was really solidify this difference between CI, you know, the thing that creates an artifact, and CD, the deployment process over time. And the debate goes, do you just make Argo CD even bigger, more features, or do you draw a line in the sand and do you create something new, purpose-built for the task at hand? And so to introduce that decision to create something new, I'm going to introduce Jesse to the stage, the CTO of Acuity, to introduce us to Argo. Welcome to the stage, Jesse. Yeah, thanks, Kelsey. And um, yeah, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so yeah, today we're here to introduce uh, this new open source project that we've been working on. Uh, it's called Cargo. Uh, and Cargo is a multi-stage application orchestration tool for promoting changes through your environments. So our goal of Cargo is to provide a, a better, more intuitive layer on top of your uh, existing GitOps tooling. And we want to enable application developers to safely promote their applications through uh, multiple environments. Uh, so before we get into Cargo, I just want to take a step back and explain uh, some of our motivations for starting this project. So first, let's talk about CICD. So Everyone is striving for this idealized expectation of continuous deployment. Uh, so the dream is that every PR that you merge into main, it builds an artifact. These days, it's a container image. Um, you test that image, and you deploy it to some target environment. Um, and the idea is that using automation, namely your CI system, you repeat this deployment and testing process, taking your change through multiple target environments until it reaches uh, production. So you've all seen this picture before. But in our experience, most organizations aren't doing hands-free, fully autonomous deployments uh, to production. And most will never actually reach that level of maturity. It, you know, it requires extensive amount of investment in your and trust in your, your automated testing to, to have that level of confidence. Uh, so Here's the reality. The reality is that real world CI CD process is a lot more complicated. And um, so first off, you're not allowing every commit to reach prod. That that just is crazy. It's too risky, right? Instead, your changes are typically batched up into like one payload, which you eventually deploy to a quote unquote staging environment. And, and staging is where you run your real tests. Maybe you have some uh, performance or scale testing. You might have a QA team getting their hands on it. Um, and then you do, uh, you do this process, quote unquote, baking it for some time, or maybe just leaving the app running, you can uncover some problems like memory leaks or just through um, you know, small organic usage. And then once everyone gains confidence in that version, you get some approval you and you deploy it to prod. If you're on the advanced side of things, you might do things like A-B testing um, or canarying and only sending a portion of the traffic to a canary. Um, once it's fully rolled out in prod, you might need to do some uh, analysis and, and measurements to check if it's, if it's uh, truly working as expected. And, and if it's not, maybe roll back. So so the reality is that continuous delivery is this, this long drawn out process that involve like manual testing, approvals, manual analysis. Um, and the end result is that you really might just deploy a few times a week instead of every commit that reaches main. Uh, and yeah, you have a question, Elsie? Yeah, I think this diagram also explains to a lot of people why they are frustrated with their build pipelines. Not so much that the pipeline's the problem, but to articulate this kind of state machine, like all these transitions, whether you should go to the next environment or sub environment or not, I think this is where people's scripts fall apart. You know, if you tried to script this out for most people I know, 
you look at your bill stages and inside of that little box, when you zoom in, there's this bash script in there yeah. trying to orchestrate this whole thing. And I think a lot of people have started to realize that, listen, everything kind of left of that bill process or right of that bill process is orchestration. And we may be better served from a declarative approach where we actually are being explicit about these individual state machines that allow us to say yes or no in terms of doing propagation. So when people see this, it's less about your current CICD system failing you, but your lack of tools to express the state machine using bash scripts. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so, so we actually, yeah. So we think about the tools that people are using to power this orchestration. It's, it's your CI systems, it's your Jenkins, your GitHub Actions, right? Um, but we do feel that these CI systems are are being over leveraged, trying to do the work of of CD that they weren't, um, you know, originally built for this this uh, more complicated uh, rollouts. Um, and everyone talks about CI CD under the same breath as as if it's this one thing, but fundamentally, uh, CI and CD have quite different goals. You know, for CI, your primary goal is given some code, build and produce an artifact. Um, but CD, your primary goal is given an artifact, roll it out as safely as possible. Um, and so, you know, CI pipelines tend to be short lived. They have this predefined beginning and end. Like we refer to them as jobs, right? And then your pipeline is done once that job completes. Um, Ideally, you your pipelines need to be quick. You know, GitHub is charging you action min, uh, by the minute, right? Every time they run, um, these drops can run in parallel because each artifact can be produced um, independently from from the other. Um, and and it's great, right? Like if you know everything that is um, ahead of time, then it's not a problem to you know define these uh, pipelines in this top down, uh, more rigid DSL. Um, and and it's great for running you know these short repeatable testing like unit and EDE testing. Uh, but when you think about CD, um, you know things are drawn out. The CD process itself doesn't necessarily have a, a predefined end. You know your deployment is done when it's done because you you really should be assessing if something is ready for prod like on an ongoing basis. Um, it's a lot of time. It's just this finger in the air feeling that you have uh, when you gain enough confidence about promoting it to the the next level. Um, and the, the scope is actually much larger. Like these days, CD requires a lot more flexibility. So if you're doing A B testing, you don't actually know if A should be should go to prod or if the B version. You, you make that decision after you gain some evidence, some real world um, evidence of, of which one is performing better. Um, so, you know, if you have one, two targets deployed to, you probably are okay with, with Jenkins, right? But once you start having these multiple deployment targets, regions, or you need to phase your deployment process over the, over the course of a week or two weeks, um, that's when uh, CI starts to show its limitations. So, um, you know, you might be wondering, well, what about Argo CD? You know, CD is in the name Argo CD. What, why doesn't it do what we want? Um, so first, let's kind of clarify what Argo CD um, is doing or is meant to do. Argo CD is all about deploying manifest um, in Git to a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so each deployment or sync, as we call it, it, it affects like a single target environment. Um, I've often described Argo CD as a as glorified kubectl apply. Um, but Argo CD, even though it is CD, it has a lot of limitations. And here's what Argo CD doesn't do. Uh, first, Argo CD has no understanding of your uh, deployed target, multiple deployed targets and how they might be related. There's There's no concept of a pipeline in Argo CD. So there's no way to orchestrate across multiple target environments. Um, it doesn't even write changes back to Git. It you know it expects something else to do that ahead of time, whether that's a human or, or a bot. Um, and then finally, once it does uh, sync the app and deploy it, 
um, uh, even though it can understand once uh, the app reaches healthy, uh, it doesn't do any verifications of the update after the fact, like such running any form of test or analysis. Um, so, and there have been, you know, these spot tools that try to solve uh, some of these specific use cases, like we have image updater, um, it solves like get right back, progressive syncs to kind of try and sequence your apps, but there's nothing really that um, puts everything together in this kind of unified um, experience. You know, one of one of the most common discussions that we have with our customers is actually how this very topic. How do you promote across your environments? You, uh, they get Argo CD up and running in minutes on our platform, but then they spend the next month like trying to script up this solution to serialize syncs across environments. And um, you know, we we give some guidance and, and poor man examples on how they can leverage their CI system to do this, um, but and there's nothing really wrong with that. You could brute force your way into that um, with, with getting something together with Argo C and Jenkins and get something working. Um, you, we've actually done it ourselves in the past. Like at my old um, company, we use Jenkins to handle you know everything that Argo CD couldn't. Um, it was the one making these automated commits to Git, um, but you know the experience wasn't great. It could it could be so much better. So you know with Cargo, we wanted to codify and improve that um, end user experience. And, that, and that's why we decided to start uh, a new project. And before you jump onto Cargo, I think one thing people have to also take into account in all of these design and architectures is the platforms that are being, uh, that are our targets, right? So if you start with a Linux server, um, the target for you is like a shell, maybe over SSH. And a lot of tools were built in that world, Ansible, Puppet, these are agents that just give a better target to a raw machine. And as we kind of move up that layer, Docker, for some people, was a better target. Docker run targets the Docker API. But if you look at that Docker run surface, it also targets only a single machine. And then we get another target, Kubernetes, right? So you go up and now target becomes a cluster, multiple machines. And before Argo CD, you had the deployment object, right? This was at that time. The holy grail, it was better than raw pods. It was better than replica sets. And it had a little logic about what a rollout was, what a rollback could be. Uh, but it was very simple and it didn't have a lot of orchestration. And for a lot of people that don't know, the deployment object comes from Red Hat OpenShift, right? A PaaS. And so targeting one cluster is kind of all you need in that world under simple terms. But then Argo CD comes out and says, hey, this deploy target is way more complicated when multiple objects are involved, where you need to be looking at different things to determine if the rollout has been successful or not. And so in many ways to me, Argo CD became a better deployment target than the standard things that come out of the Kubernetes box, but it doesn't have multi-cluster orchestration. And I think that's where you have to decide what is orchestration and what is an improvement on the deploy target? So to me, Argo CD is a last mile technology. When you've made all your decisions, you got all your orchestration in place, you tell Argo CD what to do, and it takes care of a single cluster. But now we shift our focus to multi-cluster or multi-stage orchestration, and you end up with cargo. So Jesse, I think the best way to show people what we're talking about is through a demo. So maybe we kick off the live demo and get hands-on. Yeah, exactly. Love to do that. Yeah, so um, let's start with the simple example. Um, and so, so this is the cargo UI. Um, and so the main view um, is our pipeline view. Uh, and by the way, this is the the view that we want and expect like developers, application developers, to use on their day to day basis. Like if they want to carry, you can't something... see your UI, so maybe you're sharing the wrong thing. Oh, I'm sorry. How's it? There we now? go. Yeah. Thanks for catching that. Yeah. So the main, this is our main pipeline view. Um, and, um, you know, what you're seeing is a multi-stage deployment pipeline with three stages, dev, staging, and prod. Um, but the first thing you should know about Cargo is that the way you define your pipelines is, is from the bottom up. Um, so, uh, you know, Jenkins, uh, Jenkins files and GitHub Actions is what I call top-down, where you have a single 
file that you're defining as a full knowledge of the world um, and it's you know sequencing the the steps to get to that end of the um, Jenkins file. But with stages, um, you define them from the bottom up, um, and you use typically will use stages to model your environments, um, and they're defined independently from each other. Um, the reason they're defined from the bottom up is because um, each stage will uh, describe you know which Git repo and path that stage is deploying from, and so um, so you tell Cargo where can it write uh, GitOps changes back to that Git repo. Um, a stage might be associated with an Argo CD application so that our cargo can uh, continuously monitor um, that app for health. So this, this is what that little part means. Um, and then in, in the future, the stages will describe you know, what qualification testing that needs to run um, on that stage on a, maybe on an ongoing basis. Um, so, so then once you define your stages, you now describe how they're related to each other. So stages uh, relate to other stages through subscriptions. And so a, a subscription is really just saying, watch this other thing, this upstream for artifacts. And if it qualifies in my upstream, then it's something that I can deploy to my myself, my own stage. Um, so we have here we have uh, the prod stage described to staging. Staging is subscribed to dev. Um, and then the interesting part is dev is actually subscribed to a uh, image repository. Um, and so what's happening here is um, if new images get pushed to uh, this uh, image rep uh, repository, uh, then dev can either automatically or manually um, uh, promote from that. And so, and they'll show up in what we call our freight line. Um, and which is this little uh, list at the top. So what is a freight line? And what is actually, what is freight to begin with? Um, so freight is a logical set of one or more artifacts that you want to promote and deploy as a unit. Uh, in the simplest case, freight is probably just going to be a reference to a container image tag, as it is in this example. Um, but um, and, and so when you promote freight, you're um, actually taking that image tag and will write that through like customize edit set image um, to the Git repo. Um, as, but you know, as we'll see later, freight can actually mean uh, more than just image tag. It can be a configuration that you want to promote, like an environment variable that enables some feature flag. Um, I'm going to jump in here because there's a lot yeah. of questions around this section. I think it'd be good to get a little clarification on this. So. You know, as you zoom out, as someone's seeing this for the first time, you're seeing a couple of things. One, you're kind of seeing this flow, which is very common for people that think about pipelines. Mm -hmm. And then you see things like this commit hash mm -hmm. underneath the current freight. So when we think about freights, you know, there's a lot of questions around, does this support kept? Does this support Helm charts? And so we know an image is one input into any pipeline, like this yeah. image string plus tag but normally we think of in the Kubernetes world and, and many systems that an image has to get substituted in some template, like a Helm chart, or so you already have some YAML files and all you want to do is substitute that string. Is afraid a combination of those things like, hey, tell me what templating engine you're using. We'll compile that for you, check it in somewhere, get that commit hash and use that as an input into the next stage. What's happening under the hood here? Yeah, um, great question. So yes, it, it at the end of the day, um, promoting an image is is like doing a sed replace on some YAML file. It's uh, you know there's conveniences. Customize has a convenience. Helm has a values.yaml that you you edit. Um, Cargo actually speaks all of those those common ones. Like we we um, we know that not everyone uses customize, obviously. Um, so um, yes, the a freight is for the image tag. That's the easy one. That's actually where we 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 do this essentially a set replace or or customize that set image in the GitOps repo. Um, but uh, uh, in in a kind of more advanced example, freight can be a pointer to a Git SHA that is a full set of manifests of the version that you want to promote. So I, I mentioned the um, example of like an envir environment variable. The idea is that um, 
I, um, I as a DevOps engineer, um, I want to enable a feature and it's a, a it's an environment variable that like turns some feature on. And obviously that, um, I don't want to turn it on for all my environments at the same time. Um, so you want to treat that promotion of that configuration, just like you were to do an image tag. Um, so, um, just like with images, um, uh, you know, writing, doing a set replace, it's not the same technique, but it's possible with cargo to actually take something like, um, a, a environment variable and, and promote it across your environment. So it's, there's some techniques that we do with like assuming like Git shaws and stuff that we can, um, to do that thing, but that that's the more interesting example than just image. So if I understand correctly, the idea here is that, listen, going through these stages, the artifact in this equation is the serialized templates or configuration files, right? We're going to yeah. stick with dedicated data or representation, what you want, but the inputs could be a key value representing an environment variable. And that means we just adjust that part of the configuration manifest, or it could be just the fact that all you really need is an input is an image URL and everything else is static, but either way, you as a person defining these steps or a freight, it can use the built-in dialect, which will do some fancy said magic to do yeah. the right thing using customize, or you could say, look, I'm into helm, or it sounds like you can generate your own freights using some other tool and just say, hey, promotion process, just take this Git repo hash and give me the same interface of moving it between. And I think that's what these up arrows, one of the questions we saw in the chat was, can I manually move things between the different stages in this diagram? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that actually is a perfect segue to the um, uh, pr the active promotion. I was about to talk about this next. Um, so for, first of all, um, Hopefully this is intuitive, but um, we have our different stages and we're kind of showing um, where things are at, at, at a given moment. So uh, my prod is back here, right? The dev is uh, is uh, a little ahead of staging and prod, but it's, these color indicators are, are kind of showing you where things are. So that way it gives you kind of a better, more informed decision of like what um, uh, is safe to promote. Um, so, so to promote something, um, you click on this this um, button on the left side. And you're basically promoting into the current stage, and the, the right side is about promoting outside of. Um, it's not use. It's not very. Uh, there's not much of a difference when you have this like very linear um, pipeline, but um, uh, promoting downstream to subscribers makes a big difference if you have multiple um, subscribers, which I'll I'll show in the next example. So um, let's promote dev. So as soon as I click uh, this button. Um, we highlight like all the freight that is available um, to promote. Um, so it includes stuff that even appeared in our history. So um, even though dev went through, um, you know, 16, 15, 14, and 13 already, I can still go back to that if I wanted to. Uh, but what it hasn't yet done is promoted to like 18 or 19. Um, so really, uh, this is the, um, the fully manual way. We can do this um, uh, auto promote if we wanted to. But basically, you select it and say, are you sure you want to promote this? Um, and then we'll kick off the promotion job. Um, and what's happening under the covers is Cargo will actually make this change into your um, Git repo. And then it will call the, the sync on the Argo CD app um, to, to actually deploy that change. So if we look at my GitOps repo now, um, and I refresh this, You'll see that this commit just happened. Um, and the, the diff that happened was this commit that Cargo just made um, to bump that to the next version. So I want to jump in here because there's a question about is Argo manipulating the Git repository? I think you've answered it for us visually in the demo. But there's also a bit of, I hate to say it, dogma around immutability. Mm. And so I think the challenge here is that in the world of GitOps, infrastructure is data. We want to record all of our changes this way. Like there's a versioned commit of all the configuration. And one thing that I think you're showing that may not be evident to people, you're versioning the config and the container image as atomic unit, right? Yes. So all the environment variables, all the images, everything that you need, you're trying to create this meta version. 
And this meta version goes atomically between these stages. That part, don't overlook. So now it comes down to how do you create this atomic version? Now, you could do it manually, right? You could be using Jenkins and, and Helm yeah. and customize, and you can spit out all of this thing, serialize yourself, and then go to uh, Cargo and say, hey, Cargo, I've already done the heavy lifting. Don't touch my repository. Just take this hash and promote what's there and don't deal with it. But imagine a world where you're trying to onboard people who don't really care about no GitOps. All yeah. they know is that there is an interface to get things to move through the different stages. And all they care about is images. Or maybe you're on the platform team and you want to flip a feature flag using an EMV VAR. All yeah. you care about at that point is a simple interface. But we don't want people doing the wrong thing. We don't want them doing ad hoc changes in our environments, even in dev. We want them also to be versioning things. So in this world, if you gave people a UI to get involved in the get out process, you can actually limit the credentials of the number of people who can commit. And now the UI will do the right thing. Hey, hey, you want to go to staging with a new image? Okay. This pipeline that has been given to you has already been approved by the administrators to manipulate that part of the config. But once you do and the promoter is accepted, then we're going to go do the right thing and manifest that into the repository. And yeah. then we end up with a new checksum. And that checksum allows everybody, no matter how they're participating in the get out process, to be doing the right thing. So I don't think this is a violation of that contract. It just enforces it for those that may not have access to Git repos. Marketing departments making an image change to the website. Do we really want them messing around with GitHub pull requests? That's unnecessary. Give them a pipeline that hides the implementation details. So I just wanted to jump in there so that way we don't get too dogmatic about the how and the approach. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and like, exactly. So Cargo, really, we're trying to, um, you know, hide away, like, all these nuances of, like, the, like this GitOps process. Like, these are details that, like, you know, mobile developers and, and web applications, they don't care about GitOps. Like, they just want to promote something to, to, to bring product. So giving them just, like, a, a button that kind of automates that stuff really goes a long way to kind of improving um, the, this uh, user experience. Um, so yeah, so um, I, I, I want to switch to kind of a more interesting example because this, this is what I, I consider a boring example. Um, and that's, that's when we start to have more, um, you know, decisioning um, and we subscribe to um, not just an image repository, but changes to a Git repository. Um, so this, this is going to do something different here. Yeah, yeah. I have not really dug into the details. You know, I'm an advisor. I got early previews of this, but this is probably my second time looking at this UI, right? Yeah. And for a lot of people on this call, it's their first time looking at their yeah. this UI, and they're probably trying to parse what's going on. So what I'm going to do, and I'm probably going to be wrong as hell, <laughs> but I just want you to correct me. So I'm looking at this. I'm new to Cargo. Someone got it installed after watching this webinar. And I look at it for the first time. I'm going to try to walk through what I think is happening. And then maybe you correct us and tell us exactly what's happening. Yeah. So I'm looking at the far left side of this pipeline. And I see that there's two ways to get stuff into dev. It looks like there's a way just to update an image URL. So I keep pushing to some Docker repo. And if that changes, it will start kicking over some dominoes. Or it looks like that up arrow means like manual. So I would just click on it myself and pick the image that I want to go to dev. Then I see a Git repository that says, who cares how you're doing this? You have some infrastructure repository that does the things that the freight needs to be. And if you commit there, you can also select that commit um, using that button to get into dev. And then if I like what happens in dev, it's baking. That SHA that I see in dev, I can go over to staging click on staging and say, you know what? I want the same SHA that's in dev to be in staging. Argo CD will kick off under the covers. And at some point, both dev and staging will have the exact same SHA. Then it gets interesting. Let's imagine that there's like a UAT user acceptance. I used to work in financial services. Everyone got this user acceptance environment. And in that world, we want to go to cluster A and B, but at different times, right? We don't, we want to make it big, but not have every customer in the world get the change at the same time. So I go to staging. I like what I see. I go to Canary A. Still UAT, 
but maybe in this example, there's two clusters, aka two Argo CD deployments ready to go. But here I get the orchestration now. I can say, hey, instead of telling both clusters to point at some Git thing and then pulling things down, I get orchestration instead. I go over to Canary A, I click that button, I find the same SHA that was deployed to staging, I make it so in Canary A. I could wait three days and come back and say, you know what, everything is good. I'm gonna click the same button in Canary B and make it match the same SHA in Canary A because staging could already have moved at some point. And so I just wanna match what I see in Canary A. So I'm so excited that I can see the SHA in Canary A so I can make them line up. And then I can also do the same thing for prod. Is that the way someone new to this will actually think about this? Am I describing it correctly? Yeah, actually, I'm actually super impressed that you uh, got uh, all of those details right. Like, um, and 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 yeah, for anyone watching, like I never explained that um, fully to to Kelsey. So I'm it's actually a testament to our, our UI devs to that this is intuitive like that. Um, there's some there's some details about that I wanted to um, um, uh, explain a little deeper. So you mentioned the canary A, canary B, um, and what you said is is Accurate. I can actually um, say I want Canary B to match um, Canary A, and I can I can select the same one and click promote. Um, uh, but I think the 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 interesting about this um, what um, what we want to enable with Cargo is that this this is actually um, I created this example because A B this is an A B testing. I don't know until um, until runtime until we we gather information from the real world um, traffic, which is better to, to go to prod. So this is a, a true A-B test. So when it comes down to promote to my three regions, um, East, West 1, and West 2, um, from here, I can select um, what A is running, or I can select with what B is running. Um, it doesn't matter. I don't have to get these two in sync at any point. I'm actually making a decision. A, 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 a binary decision: the, Do I want the A or the B version to go to all my uh, downstream um, production uh, environments? Um, so yeah, so it's it's basically exactly how you described, but I um, wanted to clarify some. I have a question on that people. that thing yeah. where it looks like Prod US is exporting, in some ways, limiting what can be pushed to the right mm. side of it. Is that what's going on? It's almost like. You're you're limiting the API surface a little bit by saying, "Hey, you know what? These are the only three that we're going to allow downstream of me." Is that what's happening there? Uh, yeah. So this that's a, a great um, question because this is you'll notice that the freight is not applicable here. Um, this is what we're calling a control flow stage. Um, so it's it's not actually um, so normally your stages can model model uh, real environment, but in this case um, I call it's called prod very generically named prod US because I use this as an interaction point in the UI to basically push um, changes to multiple downstreams at the same time because I I mean if you have dozens of these things I don't want to click through use like all my regions and promote one by one by one. Um, really, the, this control flow stage is to provide some conveniences around promoting, like in a in a batch. And so we'll kick off three promotion jobs uh, at once as soon as I promote downstream. Um, in the oh, future, so this yeah. So it feels like on the right hand side, when I click the arrow, it's like me pulling from the previous target, and then it feels like on the left hand side with that kind of branching logic, I get to push to everyone that's subscribe to me. So if it's 50,000 clusters, if I push that button, I'm basically saying, I want you to fulfill the thing yes. that they're subscribing to with what I'm exporting to them. So you can do both push and pull. So if you are an SRE in production, you want to do one cluster at a time because you want to let things bake or you want to do a look but verify, you could yeah. just one, two, three, or you could say, this thing is good. Yeah. We're very confident. It's an emergency change we're trying to get up for an environment variable. Just push it to 50,000 clusters right now, enter, and then boom, off they go in parallel. Yes. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. It's push uh, push on the right side, pull on the left side. That's um, exactly the way to think about it. 
Um, yeah, there's a ton of questions here. I mean, I think what yeah. people are, the, the the essence here is that it feels like we're giving people a, a visual way to support control flow. Mm -hmm. They can use their serialization of choice, ideally as early as possible in the pipeline to get these, what we call them freights, a meta version of your mm -hmm. image and all the things that go to it, environment variables, you name it, ideally Kubernetes configuration objects, bundled as one, being promoted across these environments, powered by Argo CD underneath. There's questions about what is this replacing? I think this is an additive complementary thing, right? We're looking at the spectrum of CI CD and we're adding this better orchestration level on the CD end of the spectrum. But another question that people seem to have here is, you know, do you support some active versions, right? Because as a human looking at these hashes, I have no idea if we're going forward in the timeline or backwards. Is there a way to have like a 1.1 of an environment. How do we think about semantic version in this equation? Um, so yes, the, I mean, semantic version of freight isn't um, supported. Uh, freight is um, in ordered in the order that they're first seen. So there's a field that we um, have in freight called like, we, we saw this um, combination of freight because uh, keep in mind where um, we're monitoring the tip of each um, uh subscription here and so um so as things come in we we combine it with the other that's why in this um, picture um, compared to the other picture there's actually two things here um that of, of course we have the image tag the thing that we're monitoring like the guest book stuff but then um we're also monitoring this this git repository of changes so yesterday i just i made a change where i removed two environment variables i was just doing some you know testing um but you'll see if you look carefully, like you'll see this version of the image was combined. Like I have two options. I can this version of the image seventeen. I can bind it with this um, uh, commit that I made, or this commit. So it's it's a permutation of of things that um, that have kind of streamed in to uh, this pipeline from the original source. Um, I think what people probably will ask for at some point. Is like, you know how Docker has a, it's basically an advisory cursor. Mm -hmm. You know, this tag maps to this SHA. Uh, we can debate about immutability or not, but I think having both, you know, this SHA that's like, hey, you change one thing, you're going to get a new SHA. You're going to get a bump in the timeline. Um, and then I think people need to be very careful with the concept of a tag. Because 1.1, once you start replacing what 1.1 means, does it even help you in the long run? So if there was a way to kind of give an alias Mm. Um, what this means, I think some people would say, hey, it complements our mental understanding. Canary is at 1.1. Canary B is at 1.2. And it may just make it easier for people to reason about. So I think you should do both. You know, give people like an auto-incrementing semantic version and so that they don't have to type it out themselves. That might be a nice compromise of like, hey, just like your database does with like the auto-incrementing IDs. Hey, we yeah. will do this. If you tell us this is a minor change, we'll bump the minor number. So I think the question from Sim Simbars isn't answered, but it sounds like semantic versioning will go a long way for helping people kind of rationalize, you know, where you are across all of these pipelines. Yeah, yeah. I, I think actually that's a great suggestion. The other thing we're thinking about is like, um, you know, how can I manually construct freight, right? Like maybe I want a version of, of this old one, but with some manifest changes like I made yesterday. Um, so... Um, those, those are also, that's a valid use case as well. Like, um, picking and choosing, like how you want to combine these things into a deliverable payload is absolutely a, a use case we want to support. One question that came up and I want to reiterate, you do not have to go from one source, like that prod us kind of control flow box that you see, you do not have to force yourself to have all clusters update. I think someone talked about. And one of the questions that there are critical environments that you can't do everything all at once. Yeah. You have the option of doing everything at once, but you also have the option of doing things one at a time by using the right-hand side. So push versus pull. It's up to you. I don't think you're limited. Um, it's just that both tools are in place. One thing I'm observing here is I think it's going to start to change the way we talk about a release. Mm. This combination of config, environment variables together with an image that combination equals a new thing. And I think we're all going to have to start practicing what a new thing is because one of the questions were, 
So if we are monitoring the tip of four sources, does it mean that we can pick from any of the 16 permutations? I think the answer is going to have to be yes. You're going to have so many permutations of a thing because I think for us, the thing that makes rollback almost impossible is because typically we don't bundle these things together. People are making environment variable changes independent of an image. But then when you roll back the image, you end up with the wrong combination of variables and it just doesn't yeah. work. So I think that's a, a big thing um, that we need to start considering. We need to rethink what a release is across stages versus thinking that we can twiddle bits independently of each other. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. Because like, you're right. Like once you open a door to promoting config when it used to just be um, just an image tag, it, it does make force you to rethink about how it, it makes things complicated, a little more complicated in some ways, but it enables you in other ways. So I'm going to give you another question. So Argo yeah. CD, this is from John Day. Argo CD CLI allows us to use the wait command to wait some amount mm -hmm. of time for pods to become healthy and the deployment will fail if not. What do you see if a sync fails or if a sync succeeds, but the pods do not become healthy? Yeah, that actually, I forgot to showcase this. Um, and let me switch back to um, the simple example. I think it'll be a little uh, better. So I, I wanted to show what I can promote in these three environments. So let's start with dev, because the um, dev, um, I'm able to promote anything. This dev is the uh, what we often, we, internally we refer to our zero environment. It's like the starting place. Um, but then um, you'll notice if I click on stage, I, I'm missing that, that V19 option. Um, I'm not allowed to promote this. Why, why can't I promote this? Um, and you keep in, um, going down the chain, if I click on prod, it's even more limited. Um, so what's happening here is um, freight, it needs to be qualified before it's available downstream. Um, today, what that means is um, that um, combination of image tag or git config, and after the Argo CD sync, that that app better have reached healthy state. Um, it, 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 otherwise, it won't be um, an available option to promote. So um, out of the gate, um, it's equivalent to the Argo CD wait um, that people are currently doing in their um, CI pipelines, but it's it's a little bit more implicit because um, uh, basically qualification is this this uh, switch like this um, tripwire that as soon as it became healthy in my previous upstream environment, it's now qualified. Uh, to be to go in my environment, but I don't. I can choose when I actually promote it, but it's just um, the timing of that is now separated from actually the Argo CD wait. It's, it's basically okay. Like we we print it upstream, some minutes or hours later, it's going to um, qualify, and then after that fact, I can choose um, when to actually take it further down the chain. And I know you and I talked about the necessity in the future. Yeah. of having a user give you a validation script, right? So we know you can get a lot of information from your cluster and Argo CD, but there's just sometimes where everything turns green. Yeah. You just got to run that curl command and get a certain output before you are comfortable with it being valid in terms of it being promotable to another stage. Is that something that you guys have already thought about that is coming down in the future? Absolutely. Um, so, um, and and I've actually spent years on this project a problem because um uh, for a while for many years I was actually working on Argo rollouts um and so um what what we're thinking right now is that Argo rollouts actually has this really great flexible thing called analysis it's it's um it, it's it was actually pretty cleanly developed like you can take anal this concept of analysis um and and what analysis is about is taking measurements, um, maybe your Datadog, your Prometheus, um, but uh, also an analysis could be a Kubernetes job, essentially uh, a shell script. So um, the idea that we're thinking of um, right now is that we could reuse like just this analysis portion of rollouts um, and kick that off as part of freight qualification. So without basically with like this, tiny, simple integration with um, this analysis um, uh, custom resources, we basically unlocked like 
years worth of development of how to qualify, um, I, I assess, I should say, the um, the health of a environment or stage. So that that's something I'm pretty excited about. Of, of I'm going to grab two more questions before yeah. we start wrapping it up. We're getting to yeah. the last 15 minutes of this. It's very clear. We're going to have to do another one of these really, really soon. Maybe once we get a little feedback from the community, because there's so many questions, we won't be able to cover them all. But I think there's two questions that are really, really important here. So number one, I've been in that situation where I'm a developer and I want to propose something, but not commit it yet. And so I got a PR and I remember all the tooling people used to build just to yeah. be able to test the PR locally before we merge it. How would someone go about here testing a pull request inside of this workflow? Yeah, actually, that's actually, I had this um, same discussion a week ago, actually. So, um, so what you're seeing today is actually everything that ha happens after that thing hits main. Um, but um, what you're referring to is what we call ephemeral environments, so, um, or maybe we'll call it like ephemeral stages in, in Cargo. But um, the, the idea is exactly that. I should be able to create a stage or environment that lives and dies with a pull request. So if that pull request gets open, um, you know, your CI is still going to build that, that image. And, but Cargo, what it can do is still monitor that image um, um, re repository for new digests and, and hashes, and then kind of deploy it to this ephemeral thing that is uh, temporary. Um, it's, it's a separate problem, I feel, than um, after it reaches main, um, but they're definitely in the same um, space of, of continuous testing and delivery. So it, that's another problem that we definitely um, want to uh, get our hands on as well. Yeah, so we basically need a way of having inputs also be like, hey, point to this PR mm -hmm. and whatever it resolves to, which is this kind of magical thing GitHub invented on top of Git, mm -hmm. take that identifier and then allow me to pull in that, right? So that's probably another bit of widgetry, but I'm imagining the architecture will support it. The last question before we pivot to the rest of the slides would be, you know, there's a scenario where, and I've seen this when I used to work at Puppet Labs a decade ago, dev staging both depend on, let's say an S3 bucket, for example, and the S3 bucket name is different. Mm. How do you kind of think about promotion in that case? So it's the same image, but a different environment variable for dev and staging. And last little thing I'm going to throw at you is what happens? I want to change the value of that bucket for those two different environments. Oh yeah. Uh, so this is like, I, I'll call it a kind of classic configuration management problem. Um, so I think what customized proves and it actually does really well is the fact that you have this concept of a base that is like pretty much the same for everyone. Um, and then you define overlays that is specific to um, your dev staging and prod. They have different host names, bucket names, uh, et cetera. So, um, so I, I mean, people already practice this, and we're not saying you need to change your behavior of how you're doing that. You like if something's specific to dev, you go to dev um, overlay and you make that you add that environment variable there. Um, what you can do now, though, with Cargo is that I can go to base, um, that thing that everyone was afraid of, of touching, because as soon as they touch base in, uh, without Cargo, you're like affecting prod right away. Like that, that because you're deploying from like prod um, is built on top of base, and this is a shared thing between all the things. So that was the risky, dangerous part that um, people were afraid of. Um, but but now with cargo because we have um, this kind of heavy understanding of of like uh, GitOps tooling and stuff and um, we use techniques with like like branching and stuff like we can actually let you make that change in in the base, but your your prod environment is actually it, it won't be affected by it immediately. It's going to go through the same qualification process, um, dev staging prod as like your image tags and that, and that's something. Um, like we're really excited about enabling for, for people. Yeah, and I think it's also safe to think about configuration also being its own pipeline itself, right? There's yeah. this idea that apps and config always go together. And I don't think that's quite true. I think there's a scenario where you can imagine this diagram being config on the left image 
Mm. And you can have a very small pipeline to dev where it's just like this config only affects dev. It never goes up. You can imagine having like 50 of these. So if anyone wants to make a config change, we rather them do it through this interface. It's going to do the right thing in Git. I think I did a keynote long ago at KubeCon that talked about there will be a situation where you have a bunch of infrastructure repos, some that are only going to target dev, some that target the whole pipeline. We're going to have to get comfortable with that because that's just how the world works, but it makes cloning so much easier when I could just say, take dev, substitute these values, and make it the input for the next environment. So yeah. it's, a little, it's a little nasty under the covers. This is why I think a lot of people that do have challenges with GitOps, if you make Git the interface, then you leak all of this. But when you start to have an interface like this, you get to say Git is just the serialization engine underneath. This is the workflow above. And I think that's going to be the thing that you're going to have to give it time. GitOps yeah. is dope, but it's an implementation detail. And we shouldn't shy away from having lots of repos if that's what's required to get the granularity that we want as we start to manage our different environments. I think we're going to do a follow-up. So <laughs> this is early. This is a live demo. I think the product is ready for you all to start kicking the tires. It's an open source project by, by, backed by a commercial entity. Um, let's go to the slides and talk a little bit about the relationship and architecture-wise. Yeah. All right. Um, let me make sure you can It's not this. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, first kind of, in case you didn't pick up on what actually is happening under the covers, um, this is kind of like how cargo fits into your existing tool chain and how, how it works under the covers. Um, so first of all, you know, we're not here to replace your CI system, but what we are trying to do is reduce the scope of what you're using CI to do it. Like keep um, letting it do what it's best at, which is building and producing artifacts. Uh, but once an artifact is made available, um, you can let Cargo uh, pick that and, and uh, take over. So what we can do with Cargo is orchestrate the GitOps portion for it too. So once we detect an image, um, we'll then commit that image to your GitOps repo. Um, once it's in the GitOps repo, we'll sync that change into the cluster. Uh, and then comes that verification qualification piece that I mentioned. Um, after Argo CD did its job is um, we'll, you know, kick off your user-defined uh, testing or analysis to um, mark that freight as qualified to the next step. And then finally, um, once it is qualified, uh, a, a, and usually like a DevOps engineer can pull the trigger on promoting that change to the next um, stage. So that um, this is kind of like how Argo CD, I mean, Cargo is fitting into what you're um, partially doing today, and maybe like replacing some of the the cobbled together, you know, scripts and stuff that you were trying to do for for this piece. Um, and I, I have one more question. Yeah. I think I, I should get you to answer. Yeah, you know, there's scenarios where you just don't want to go through staging. You need to go straight to mm -hmm. prod. Is there a way to bypass and just say, "Yo, I got something that's baking." Um, I guess there's going to be this challenge, like how do you resolve the freight so I can just go to production and say, yo, this thing hasn't been qualified in staging yet, but I need to just take this freight straight to prod. Is there a way to bypass stages to go straight to another one? Uh, there will be. I, I, that's definitely a use case we want to support. So um, so as of, as of now, the, the freight is automatically qualified or not um, based on um, the health of the previous upstream. Um, but going straight to pro, like, like, let's be real that like people have to do, be able to do that. Like a hot fix it needs to be able to do it without going through this lengthy, uh, promo cycle. Um, uh, so yes. So the short answer is like, yeah, we, we want need, sometimes you just got to go to prod. And I guess the, the truth is here is that in, in this kind of declarative world of Kubernetes, someone has to resolve the inputs with the configuration data to create this freight object. Yeah. And I guess you could abuse with a phantom stage and environment that does nothing other than let you resolve and get that commit. Um, but I do think there's this question of if staging is only between, let's say UAT and prod, if 
spot has nothing to pull from, right? Because it hasn't been validated in the stage below it, right? So that's going to be very interesting. If you could skip and say, hey, I want to pull from prod the thing that has been baked in staging. Will that even be possible? Uh, so you, you mentioned something I I didn't want to bring up, but you could actually model it the way you described with the, uh, a phantom stage, I guess you could say. Um, and I didn't want to bring it up because it, it, it's a little bit of a, I'll call it a workaround to the problem. Um, but yes, prod could subscribe to the, the proper uh, staging um, stage and, and go through that. But there's actually today, it, it's also possible for prod to subscribe to like a shortcut. Um, and uh, uh, Okay. Well, I mean, yeah. I think at some point we got to write these things down because you know what's going to happen. Someone's yeah. going to figure out how to do this. And it's going to be the thing they do in production. And no one's going to talk about, number one, that it's possible. And maybe, just maybe, you should do it if you have to, to break glass. Mm -hmm. But the Argo project, uh, the cargo project, should eventually make that a first-class thing. Yeah. So it can be intentional. We got five more minutes. Let's step through the other slides. I think we definitely now see, and we can answer that question again, you have to be able to understand that we're not necessarily replacing things. We understand the CICD spectrum. And I think the thing that we want to get rid of is all of that weird bash kung fu you're doing inside of your pipeline that just no one understands. So we mm -hmm. want to bring the same semantic energy to that part of the facade and bring orchestration closer to where we produce our artifacts. So that way Argo can continue doing what it's good at and stay focused. And this new tool can pick up all of the stuff that we're talking about in a streamlined way that layers on top. So I think that is just the perfect way to continue. Let's step through the next set of slides. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll just kind of, uh, kind of reiterate like what we have today um, with cargo and then like what we want to be doing tomorrow. So, um, you know, one of the biggest things you're going to get with cargo is just this newfound visibility and control um, into your deploy targets. Uh, so all your environments at a glance, seeing what's running where, um, what's safe to deploy um, and then just understanding the lineage like we'll link to all these um, sources that it's coming from so you can understand what actually exactly it is you're promoting um, so we built this with the the GitOps um, mindset in place like th this is you know GitOps has been great but it's caused like all this pain of um, you know, now now my CI pipelines can't really touch prod anymore. Like you've you've severed access to prod. How am I expected to perform my testing if I can't access the the system, right? So um, so yeah. So we we um, built this for GitOps first. Like we made it really easy to orchestrate these uh, Git commits, um, and we want to enable progressive delivery. So um, this is the you know the next thing after continuous delivery, like being um, con 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 continuous deployment was kind of, in my opinion, like a pipe dream. Like it was this unachievable uh, thing. No one is taking every commit to prod like hands free. Um, so really, let's be real. Let's try to do a more um, uh, pragmatic approach to uh, deploying to prod. And so, uh, Cargo helps you do that. Um, we do have actually um, examples of us doing like an Istio based um, promotion where we kind of um, shift traffic gradually over by um, making uh, git commits to the um, uh, different Istio destination rules, right? That that um, or, or sorry, the, the image is targeted behind the destination rules, and and we actually can achieve um, traffic split progressive delivery using Cargo without the need for Argo rollouts. In fact. Um, and in terms of like what we want to do next, um, I think. A lot of it's around centered around like customized um, ability. Like we don't have um, all the answers on like what does it mean, what a promotion means to you. Um, so we have the, the 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 common examples, which is a git commit, but maybe a promotion to you could be opening a PR to another branch and then just waiting for that PR to get merged, right? So um, having other alternative forms of of promoting. Um, the qualification, I touched on this earlier, um, this should be user-defined tests and analysis um, that qualify freight. 
Um, we ha we keep hearing the, in, in terms of um, extensibility, we keep hearing use cases like, hey, we have this like legal or policy requirement, like you know things like Jira tickets have to be open and closed whenever fraud changes are made. So providing hooks into um, you know the act of promoting is um, something we hear a lot. And then finally, just the the continuous verification, right? Testing shouldn't just be this one time event in your um, your environment or stage. Um, we think it should be this ongoing health assessment. But even if it was looked like it was passing on day one, on maybe a week or two later, like like it could be failing for stuff that just took time to to figure out. So continuous ver verification is another. Um, but yeah, there's a lot to um, do. And so, you know, what we really feel like cargo is filling this gap that is um, kind of left behind by in these, these current crop of GitOps tool. Um, and we, we want to look for people to get involved, you know, bring best thing you can do, um, join the discord, bring your use cases and make, force us to think about these um, use cases that, that we didn't anticipate and that I'll say that was hugely successful in Argo CD when um, we just listened right to, to what people uh, needed to do. Awesome. Look, this brings us to the end of the webinar. This is an open source project. So community, y'all know what to do. If you think this thing needs to improve in some way, your voice is going to be heard just like it was heard in Argo CD. Now you have a new tool in which to express ourselves. And again, I want people to zoom out here. For almost two decades, we've been thinking about this concept of software delivery, CI, CD. CI is this part where you take your code, you build it, you produce an artifact. 15 years ago, you were probably creating RPMs. It's 2023. A lot of people are creating container images now. That plus config is what your environments are actually composed of. And so we want to make that explicit now. And the way we're going to do that is thinking about things like freight. That permutation together can be meta versions. And as we meta version it, we can think about that as an atomic unit. And remember, as we go from the pipeline down to the deployment stage, there needs to be orchestration there as well. And so now that we've built better deployment targets, that's what Argo CD has been about. It will stay in place. Kubernetes stays in place. But now instead of teaching Argo how to be multi-cluster aware or do orchestration of its own, let's just build an explicit layer that sits above these deployment targets. So we can actually just focus on orchestration. We did this before. Docker sits below Kubernetes. Kubernetes is an orchestration layer above Docker. This is the best system architecture design you can do. It's less disruptive and it leaves room for innovation. So we're gonna continue tackling the gaps in that CI CD and we're gonna do it pragmatically. And it's gonna give you way more control to really express these complex scenarios that we have deployments. Join the Discord, and I got a feeling we're going to have to do another follow-up on this as we get into the details of how this thing works and way more advanced use cases. So until next time, thanks for hanging out with us, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks, Elsie.